So hi, everybody. I'm Celine. I'm part of the organizing team in World A Day of Pittsburgh. Uh, and thank you for attending our Connected World panel uh, today. So um, I wanted to just get started and say thank you to our local sponsors who, uh, along with our ticket purchasers, are making uh, our event possible. Uh, so I'll move on to the, the oh, next slide. Uh, we have two bronze sponsors, Shift Collaborative and Trailblaze Creative. Uh, we also have many friend level sponsors um, that, that are Desudio, SDLC Partners, Beacon Hill, Barkley REI, Dick Sporting Goods, Aspirant, and Tech Systems. Uh, we're very happy that they made our you know, event actually be you know, affordable and we get to th do things like closed captioning. Uh, and right now I want to just get back to the first screen. Um, our moderator today is uh, Mithi Moreno, and she's an Agile coach and a Scrum Master for Velocity Works. Uh, she's also an entertainer based in Pittsburgh, and I think her energy requires no further introduction because you'll get to experience it in our panel, and she is very cool and amazing, uh, along with our, our panelists. So uh, I'll give, I'll stop the screen share and give the mic to Missy. Hi, thank you so much, Celine. I'm cool and amazing. I didn't know. <laughs> Well, you're all going to feel cool and amazing as we celebrate World Information Architecture Day, um, the Pittsburgh chapter here, and we get to be part of the awesome UX content creators panel. I am honored to be your moderator today. While we have such beautiful, awesome humans with us, going to share so much to help you and all of us think differently about UX, um, about YouTube channel creations and all the great things. So let me just take a minute to happily introduce each of our friends here today. If you want to just give a wave or a shout out after I get to you. Um, we're going to start with the fabulous Han Bang. Hi, Han. Han is a designer based in Toronto. She has spent time in startups and enterprise companies across several different industries from fintech to entertainment to UGC. Currently, Han is leading a design team at Scotiabank Digital and in her YouTube channel, which we'll find out more about later, she talks about product design, user experience, tech, self-development and stuff. I love it. Han, hi, how you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you for that awesome introduction. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Um, let's talk about Sarah Tajima. Hi, Sarah. She is a senior product designer at Webflow and the founder of The Craft. At Webflow, she lead designs for the ecosystem. And at The Craft, she runs a design education and consulting startup. So cool. She provides educational content for people who want to learn design in her YouTube channel, The Craft with Sarah Tajima. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Well, I'm Great good. introduction. Why, thank you. It is exciting to like see all the cool stuff you do and everyone like Risa Hiyama. Hi, Risa. Risa is a product designer from Tokyo, Japan, now working in Los Angeles, California. And she started her design career without a degree and founded an augmented reality startup. So she now works for Netflix on the Studio XD team. What? She talks design on her YouTube channel, Risa Pizza, which I need a shirt of that immediately. Yay, hi, Risa. Hello, I'm so excited to be here. Oh, I know. I'm so excited to learn more about everything everyone does, especially like our friend George Chang. George, hi. He's been working in design and tech for the past decade, y'all, from mature companies like Google and Amazon to startups like Driveway and CrowdTap. Well, now he's trying to give back to the Chinese speaking design communities by establishing Unblock, which is a design education platform on YouTube. George, hi, how are you? I'm good, even better <laughs> since you started talking. Uh, I'm excited. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, we are so happy to have you here, George, and everyone today as we dive into this juicy conversation with all of you experts in UX content design and showcasing that to the world. Um, quick question, is this the first time you all met each other today? 
Look at the power of panels. No, but that's so cool. Due to the magic of us all living in this awesome world you all actually create, um, look at how we've been able to be brought together to learn more about each other. Isn't that so amazing? <laughs> so I'd love to ask that a question to all of us, our panelists today. So we've been in some isolation due to this global pandemic, right? So today we've been able to gather, and this is like second nature, jumping on a Zoom call. All of our attendees also welcome to you. Thank you so much for being here. Please ask some questions. Um, the one I want to kick off with is in a world of isolation, you know, how do you think that has affected designers with interacting with each other or you in any way with your fellow designers? Who would like to take a shot at that first? Thoughts? I'll take a stab at that. Um, my experience has been a, a little bit interesting because um, in the last two-ish years, so I guess the pandemic was like 2020. Um, it, it I know, it feels like so long ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was kind of a split for me. So uh, we shifted to uh, work from home pretty like quickly at, at my previous company. And so um, we had to quickly learn that the work from home that we did before the pandemic, we couldn't just copy and paste that into the pandemic work from home because obviously there wasn't, the world wasn't on fire <laughs> when we were working from home previously. Um, but also just the like semi-permanent nature of working from home, like having to switch our communication styles from, you know, being able to like cross someone in the hall and be like, oh, we had this like really cool conversation with this person and it just happens it was all happenstance. Um, but now I think that communication in the remote world needs to be a lot more explicit. Like you have to carve out that um, effort and energy to communicate and have to figure out which types of communication makes the most sense. So there's a lot of asynchronous um, communication now, you know, like doing Loom videos and not having to have a million meetings. Um, and so I think that for me was the biggest one, but then I also spent all of last year on parental leave. Uh, so that was a, a completely a different type of uh, experience altogether, being home with a newborn with pretty much locked down the entire year. So. Yeah, found a lot of, I leaned on community a lot, which I think YouTube does allow for, and I, I love that for it. Oh, congratulations on being a mom. That's amazing. Um, that's a great thought. I love that. Which type of communication suits best? That's so cool. What are some of your other experiences? Yeah, I can take that. Um, yeah. So, oops, sorry, Sarah. I no, we'll like get to Sarah. Is that okay? I saw the dive for it. We'll get to. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So, you know, outside of my full time job, um, working on Unblock, which is my YouTube channel, uh, the team members are mostly uh, scattered around the world. We have the creators. Uh, so, it's including myself, there are five creators on the channel. And all of us are sitting in different places. Uh, we have New York, we have Texas, we have Canada. And then there is a platform team that's in Taiwan. So, you know, even for the YouTube content creation, we have a lot of communications that we need to kind of innovate around. Um, what I feel like personally I experienced is that uh, I wanted to stay very open to all these different tools. So for example, on our team, we use Gather. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, it's like sort of a metaverse type of tool where you, it kind of mimics uh, the real life interactions with almost like a game-like environment. Um, and so you can have site, uh, site conversations, hallway conversations, rather than always set up meetings. Uh, so I think like, you know, if anyone said that they figured out exactly how to work remotely, I would, you know, call them out because it's, there's, the tools are following up as well. Um, so yeah, that's what my experience has been. It's really also good for someone like me who's very introverted. So I take a lot of advantage of like working from home, heads down time, um, but at the same time, understanding that communications are needed and these tools are helpful. Oh, that is, that's really so inspiring. And you're right, we haven't all figured it out, so which is why we're here today. So Sarah, how can you add to this conversation? Yeah, it's funny. I was going to say that designers tend to be a little bit more extroverted, at least maybe compared <laughs> to engineers, I guess. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, I think, you know, working in office and working remotely, they both have positives and negatives because when you're working in office, a lot of people tend to become friends with each other. All the designers, you know, tend to become friends with each other. And so you're spending a lot of face time together. And then when you're working remotely, you don't have that same connection. So I actually found that with YouTube, I something I didn't expect was that I started to build a lot of connections with other designers and that sort of replaced the in-office connection. Oh, that is so wonderful. Yeah. And I have to geek out for two seconds. I have subscribed to each of your channels <laughs> and love that, but I'll nerd out more. Risa, what has helped you? Yeah. Oh, so uh, one of the things I learned recently uh, as a designer, what's important is not just design the product, but also design relationships, right? So one of the things that we have been doing with our uh, team members is that uh, we've been trying to set up a place we can feel connected. So I think the remote situation sometimes can isolate folks, right? And also when we're in meetings, when you say something, you can't really read the other person's um, feelings and opinion because, you know, there's it, we're separated by screens. Um, so one thing uh, as a design leader that I feel responsible for is to set up that collaborative space. Like everybody else mentioned in this call, we leverage Fig Jam and we do a lot of like ice breaking. And another thing we, we started doing is to um, send each other's kudos on Fridays. And we plant those seeds where we have opportunity to feel connected. So I think the, the, this environment really pushed us to be more creative in terms of how we feel connected. And YouTube is one, ADP List is another platform that connects mentors and mentees, which I've been heavily using recently. So yeah. Um, That's awesome. <laughs> no, I love that. That's you blew my mind with design relationships. I love that. And it sounds like, obviously that's something everyone's innovating already. As I personally got to visit each of your YouTubes, cause I also go on the internet. Um, and I was just, each of you have crafted such a unique, cool world and your channel in this mat subject matter too, which was so inspiring as someone that's not directly in this, and I love the fact that we're bridging the gap of extroverts and introverts. I'm an extrovert, believe it or not, but it's so nice to hear there's options for us all. Um, so in that sense, with your channels, which is like your own little world, who would you say are your target audiences that you really want to speak to? Um, and with that being said, how do you feel pumped or inspired to engage with that audience you want to speak to? Who feels like they want to dive in on that? Uh, I can uh, yeah. speak to that. So I think that my channel naturally became geared a little bit more towards junior designers or people trying to break in, um, which, you know, I think maybe I went in with the intention of just creating educational design content and not necessarily thinking about like, I want advanced designers or I want, you know, entry level designers. But um, I realized through the people messaging me and responding to me that a lot of people were completely new to design. And so th these were the people that were really in need of resources, I guess. And that's who I started catering more towards. Um, sometimes I make content where a, a more senior designer will respond and be like, wow, I've been working for five years now, but I still found this really helpful. So I think that's also nice is like, we're all kind of working towards becoming better at our craft. And there's not necessarily like a point where we reach a level of perfection and we're like, okay, we're done learning or we're done trying, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And hearing your audience makes that feel again, it's transcending that I'm not with you physically, but I'm present with you. So yeah, that's so cool. You went with your audience. Love that. Risa. Yeah. So I, I thought about this question and I think the answer is I am designing for past Risa that was going through so much struggle right and so I'm Japanese and I came to America two years ago language was a huge barrier not just language but communicating in meetings in a confident way was something that I really struggled so um, and then other stuff like 
trying to become a senior designer? How can I level up? How can I speed up in my career? So, um, and then another thing that I, I've been super leveraging is the mentorship. So I've been doing mentoring a lot last year and I was able to pick up what these folks were struggling with. For example, whiteboard challenge was a big topic. So I've been trying to um, trust my past and also get some uh, information from the mentees. Ah, oh, that is so cool. Yeah, I saw that video. And as someone that has done tech interviews, I'm like, that's scary. So love that you touched on that. George, do you have any comments on that? Because I love that Risa kind of touched on the language barrier. And I know that's a passion of yours. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I love this question. Uh, I think also wanted to share a point of view on if you are someone who is just thinking about content creation as well, maybe you want to start your own YouTube channel. You know, it could be very intimidating to have those answers figured out at first. Like, oh, I need to know who my TA is. I need to know what size this is. Almost thinking of it as like a business. Um, I really encourage everyone to kind of think about it agile, just. Uh, because of my experience, you know, when I started, I definitely had a, an idea that almost like what Mr. was saying, I wanted to help me when I was in college, I didn't study design, I studied psychology and was trying to kind of switch lane and wanted to help people like me, if there's any. Um, and then slowly by putting more content out there, read the comments sections um, or read DMs on Instagram, did I start figuring out, you know, at this time, what are the people who are like me are struggling with? You know, not necessarily exactly the same problems I used to have um, because I grew up at a time where like internet wasn't even that accessible. Mm. Um, so, you know, I, I love that question. And right now, I think what I figured out, uh, at least at the moment, is that I'm trying to help people who are emerging Chinese speaking designers who are about like zero to five years of experiences. Um, they want to either just enter the field or they're trying to create more influence in their, in their environment. Uh, those are people that I really wanted to serve. Oh, that's just beautiful. And of course, I'm like, Agile, yes. Oh, that having the conversations, being present and going with the flow, like being in the moment, even though it's anywhere in the world. Oh, that's so exciting. Han, I know you have innovated such fun content and stuff. <laughs> as shared what are your thoughts on this I don't know I resonate I think with everyone's answers here where yeah. it's like you know constant learning I think part of wisdom is realizing how little you know so it's like at the beginning you're like oh I think I know all this and it's like as you progress in your career especially as a designer you're like I don't know anything actually and sometimes it's the junior folks who come in or the early designers who come in and kind of give you a whole different perspective because their experience of technology is so different than yours. Um, and then also, yeah, in, in, in both Risa and George's answers too, it's like I'm selfishly making these videos for like past on. So it's like being my own big sister, right? It's like, what would I have done differently? How can I expedite someone's journey? Like instead of it taking me, let's say seven years to get where I am now, you know, how can I help someone do that in a little bit less time or, you know, not make the same mistakes or speak up a little bit more? Um, so things like that. And I'm kind of, uh, you know, in my own journey of, of like kind of figuring out who I am now as a first generation immigrant who has been in Canada for 30 years. So it's like, am I still Vietnamese? Am I this person? Am I like, do I have the same struggles as someone? Can I help those people? And so it's, it's an interesting thing um, to kind of explore identity through content creation as well. And so if I can help anybody, whether it's through design or just uh, adjacent topics, which is why I put the stuff in there in my design channel, it's just like, you know, just keeping the field a little bit open so that I don't feel boxed in and necessarily always having to talk about like design, design, design all the time, because I think we all have lots of cool things to share that are not necessarily just, you know, design all the time. Oh, that explore identity through content creation and from everything you said from your you know background but even right like stuff you're doing as a person existing today in 2022 I love feeling the connection you all have of this passion for those that have that dream where where you are now and are established with where you are now that and that feeling is definitely felt when visiting your channels um 
And so I guess I'd love to explore a little bit more about your life as a professional too. Each of you have ooh, such amazing journeys and how you're actually affecting the active world in the professional sense. So in speaking to your past selves or future yous, what would you say are some of the most necessary skill sets for designers, especially in a 2022 and beyond landscape? I know that's a heavy one. <laughs> I really gave you a challenge there. <laughs> no. I think the most underestimated skill would be business, like having a business sense as a designer. Because what I see from a lot of junior designers is that they're so focused on making pretty visuals that they don't, um, yeah, they don't spend a lot of time trying to understand like quantitative or qualitative methods that could help inform the design so that you're actually making designs based off of like something substantive instead of just trying to make it uh, pretty. And I think I also had this kind of misconception when I became a designer, which is that you know, I was like, okay, to become a designer, I need to like learn Figma or learn Sketch. And I didn't understand that there was more behind that. And it's not like design is not just the visuals. Mm, not just the visuals. Yes, that's so insightful. What do you think, Han? Yeah, um, I, I think that is definitely it. And, and I think kind of just bridging that is communication um, is, you know, being able to not only do the research and kind of back up, back that up, but also create relationships and understand that a big portion and this will increase as you progress in your career is uh, design is mostly communication, right? Design is a form of communication. So um, I, as I progressed in my own career as a senior designer now to a manager, um, I find myself talking a lot more than I'm actually spending time in Figma. And so I think just bursting that bubble a little, and I obviously there are, um, you know, design paths that do focus a little bit more on heads down, just craft, but a big portion of it is communication. And so I think if anybody can work on that, and that's something I'm currently work, like still working on is effective communication, um, you know, helping influence decisions, whether that be uh, to folks further up, like kind of up or managing down or managing sideways. So communication, and I know this is, could be like one of those tough spots for folks who are more introverted, but I think you don't necessarily need to be extroverted to be an effective communicator. So yeah. Ooh, that's a good tip. I like that. I want to cross stitch that on something. That's good. You don't have to be an extrovert to be a good communicator. Risa, what yes. do you think? <laughs> oh my, uh, plus, plus one on that. Um, yeah. I think one is, you know, storytelling and facilitation on top of communication skills, right? So the word that I used to hear a lot when I was um, uh, starting off was designers not having a uh, seat at the table or um, voice not being heard. That was like a, a huge issue. But now I start to hear that less and less. And I think it's because designers are the one who's bridging the, the different cross depart departments, right? And designers are the one who started to facilitate the room and um, set up the stage at the meeting and show some, uh, what, ex elaborate on why we're here at and what problem we're solving, right? And I'm a, a extreme introvert and design and design has helped me a lot in terms of how to set the stage and how to facilitate. You know, we have the power, not just words, but visualize what we want, what we want to tell, what kind of stories we want to tell, right? So um, communication doesn't just mean like words that's coming out of your mouth. It also means like leveraging your visual design skills to visually inform um, and communicate and align the team. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, like creating an experience with your thoughts. That's so cool. George, anything you'd like to add? <laughs> I'm just taking advantage of everyone's answers. To that. Know, They're me. so profound. I like learned so much too. Um, I have I, maybe just one thing to add. Uh, it might sound super cliche and conceptual, but uh, empathy. Um, honestly, I think like, you know, for for creatives, like when you spend all these time heads down and just like trying to build this baby of yours, it's really easy to be protective of it and get into a space where you know you are just trying to convince 
And I think, you know, empathy, obviously we know we need to empathize with our users or with our customers, but sometimes it's harder to empathize with your partners, uh, with the people you work with. And, but that's actually, at least based on my past experiences, the key for, you know, just like me, who's an in introvert to actually open up um, those um, very natural organic persuasions. You understand the other person's goal and then you can actually have a very effective uh, conversation. Uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, I started this channel by myself and now expanding it to all these different domains, you know, product management, product uh, UX design, service design, brand design, because I think like when you work in a product house, whether it's big or small, at the end of the day, you will have to work cross-functionally. And that's mm. sometimes a big measurement for whether a, a designer is successful or not. And so you have to kind of understand their goals. Why are they trying to be conflicting with your perspectives and then find you know, that middle point? So uh, I would just add empathy, you know, active listening, uh, try to you know, understand who you're talking with, why are they doing this uh, is something that whether you're a designer or not, probably should try to improve. Just, I'm mean, trying to improve every day too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so many of the things you're all sharing, I'm like writing notes because they're nuggets for life. I'm feeling massively inspired and that chat is like active. So you are, we're, you're inspiring people right now and that's really cool. Um, and I'd love to dive into what you just kind of opened up, George, on how you had a platform, had a dream, all of us, all of you here have, and you expanded it to have other people participate in it. And that's so cool. Again, it's so exciting that each of you not only design, but have a hub where you want to be extending your thoughts, views, everything about your life experiences into your actual work. So I guess, can you share with us what are some of the maybe challenges you've faced in running your YouTube channel? And then I'm going to flip the table on you in a little bit because I like to think of the high points too but what are some challenges you face in getting your content out there mm, oh man that's a that's also a great question I think in the beginning it was imposter syndrome I'm a mm -hmm. very addicted YouTube watcher <laughs> that I watch so many videos um, and <laughs> yeah the same. I, I think I've also like learned so many things through YouTube luckily and so when I think about me on the other end of the, the table, like I get really nervous and I think about, oh my God, like what can I, what can I provide? And, and even just like speaking to the camera like this, you know, you're just in your room and you're like, I don't know if I'm doing good or not. So it, I think the first challenge is imposter syndrome. It almost made me feel like I went back to design school, you know, day one, just like, okay, I don't know how to use these tools. Um, but I, but because of that, it also made me recall, you know, this important saying, I guess, for, for all designers is that you trust the process, right? You don't always de depend on these inspirational moments, but just, you just do the work and one day it's going to reveal itself to you. And so, you know, that's how I overcome that challenge. It's still day-to-day -day challenge, but, uh, you know, trying to like, just do the work and, and feel that uh, improvement will come later. Uh, that's kind of the the first challenge. And then all the things that we talk about in terms of communication, because now the channel is more than just me, um, it definitely became way more complicated than before. <laughs> you know, even simple things as like legal, legal things like, you know, you have to have rights to their content, all that kind of stuff. So it, it became like, you know, more complicated. But one thing I would say is that like, uh, have fun. Like, I think that's what I told the other creators on the channel too. Some of them have imposter syndromes too. And I would just tell them like, you know, let's just have fun. Don't forget that this is also just, you know, an expression of creativity. Um, so, you know, let's just do what we think is fun and, you know, we'll figure out the results later. Oh, yay. Again, more t-shirts I want to make. Trust the process and the work will reveal itself to you. This is amazing. Um, Sarah, what are your thoughts on George bringing up like the lawyer thing? You kind of mentioned the business is an important thing to remember. Has that been a challenge with your YouTube or anything maybe surrounding that? Your yeah, um, somehow less so. Like I think when I created my challenge and it's quite recent, like within the last year, um, he also mentioned that he struggled with the camera a little bit 
And that's also something that I found super awkward because you're just like in a room by yourself talking to an inanimate object. Like you might as well be talking to a water bottle or something <laughs> and you have to bring energy, which is so difficult because you're just like, oh God, I just, it feels really weird talking to, yeah. It's so much easier when you're interviewing someone and you have someone else on the other side of that, like communicating back to you um, and it feels more natural. And so I think being someone who is quite shy and not com like not super comfortable on camera and not super comfortable talking to like a bunch of people, it was something to get used to. Um, and now I do feel a little bit more comfortable on camera because I've had interactions with people that follow me. And so I can actually picture the people that I'm talking to. Um, and so I think that has helped me a lot. I think the biggest, biggest challenge that seems to be quite consistent throughout like beginning up until now is time management because as everyone here knows when you're working a full-time job it's so hard to find the time to do the things that you need to do and so it really comes down to prioritization which I think also as a product designer is like a fundamental skill to have and so you're really like okay I have this endless list of things that I need to do what is the most important what will have the most impact and yeah, kind of going from there and making sure you're managing your time well. Yeah, no, absolutely. On a side note, I think all of us should send you our pictures so you can put that behind your camera and we'll be the ones you're talking to. Anyways, just a thought. Um, <laughs> what do you think, Risa? Any challenges for you? And those are great insights, of course. Yeah, um, well, the reason why I started YouTube was actually to train my communication style. Uh, the first video I, I recorded was so terrible. I was like stuttering. My inner thought was kicking in and I was like, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I had to say, hi, I'm Risa Pizza 22 times before I got, I felt okay. And I want the first video I started recording at sometime like 8 a.m. And I kept going without drinking, without eating until like, 5 p.m. and the sunlight was different <laughs> and when I added the video together the light was really off and it was really bad and I that's when I realized I just need to keep going I can't stop in the middle of the sentence and start all over again so um, this actually starting YouTube video really really helped me be more comfortable in meetings because I don't hear that inner critic anymore I just keep going and I feel a little bit more confident so it was definitely a challenge, but um, because of that, I think I'm I'm a more confident designer and a person. <laughs> oh, I love that. That is really cool. YouTube, there's your slogan, makes us more confident. No, it, it's so true, that practice. What about you, Han? How are your thoughts on some challenges? I, I feel like when you asked the question, like I was looking at Risa, we we're both laughing because we're like, oh my God, we can, how much time do we have? Like we can spend, I can spend all day talking about this because I think um, it sounds really easy, right? Like upload videos to YouTube, but they think the quality bar has been like pushed so, so, so high that you start comparing yourselves to the greats, right? Like the Casey Neistats. And I'm like, I have to, you have to kind of bring yourself down to earth where you're like, I'm not going to be Casey Neistat because I'm not a videographer. I'm here sharing design. Um, and so just remembering all of that, but also um, kind of on the opposite spectrum, I'm very much an extrovert and I find myself like an energy magnifier. So like if we have energy in the room, I can like be 10 X the energy um, and bring like the energy up in the room. But with a camera, there's no one talking back to you. And the thing with the camera is it kind of dilutes your energy so you kind of have to go like 20 percent above so you're acting a little crazy what you find right like you have to really animate and talk because that's just how the camera can capture it and so i think that to me is kind of a struggle because i try to be as natural as i can uh, and then i'm like rewinding the video footage i'll be like why did you do this or why did you do that and like oh my god you look dead behind the eyes in this shot <laughs> just like you know you just like kind of like zone out sometimes um but yeah I think that is kind of just this constant like comparing yourself um and your journey and sometimes the numbers can get in the way of that and so I think just with Risa it's just like 
just compare yourself to your last video. Don't you don't need to compare yourself to anybody else and just continue your journey. Um, but I think other things like consistency and making videos for yourself versus for your audience, like sometimes when the, those two topics match up, that's amazing. Um, but sometimes I want to talk about certain things. That I'm like, I don't know if my audience will resonate with this. And so I think sometimes that makes me rethink things. Um, but again, I think that's something I'm working through. And it's like, depending on what your goal is for the channel, either way could be good. Oh yeah, that's so good. And you are such a magnet of energy. And additionally, I'd love to see outtake videos of every one of us standing in front of our camera in our room, like being a crazy fun person. <laughs> Cause you're right, it takes that. And that's so interesting. Everyone's challenges were so similar in that way, um, which I'm sure that has to be a common thread. And thanks so much for being vulnerable with that information. I'd love to flip the script and maybe hear what have been some rewards, some great things you have found through your YouTube channel that maybe surprised you, um, things like that. So what do you think has been rewarding for you, Risa? Yeah, I mean, this event itself, right? Uh, the organizer contacted me through the YouTube channel that she saw and that was mind-blowing I was like wow people actually read this uh, watch this and then also interesting thing was when I was applying for Netflix right and I was interviewing the people who was interviewing me already knew who I was because they would look at my YouTube video before even talking to them so that was kind of a cool feeling too um, so video could potentially help your interview process too yeah oh my gosh opening doors yes uh, Risa pizza I'm telling you that's gonna be like a cartoon on Saturday morning I'm loving it <laughs> yes yeah. what other rewards have you all felt or experienced or any type of joy that maybe you didn't expect I think just to uh, continue on that path, I really encourage anyone to, it's almost like you're building your brand, right? And so very much like you have a portfolio, you're creating content um, that does kind of go under the umbrella of your brand, of your portfolio. And so just being able to show like that you have, I mean, video editing skills and these chops are always a plus um, and people can, your personality will kind of um, uh, precede you a little bit. And so if people have a little bit more you know, they know what to expect. Um, but I think for me, one of like the most rewarding things are the messages I say, oh my gosh, like your video helped me in X way. Or, um, you know, I was really thinking about this. And when I saw your video, I got really inspired to look up UX and like, I never knew this was a thing. And it, so I think that was like those very personal messages where you've helped someone. Um, and this, I think the journey of YouTube can be very lonely outside of like the comments. And so when you do get those little pieces of interaction, uh, the feedback, it makes it that much worth it. Like, cause then you're just, it validates every, all the struggles, I think from the post or from the production side um, and to, to be able to get that validation afterwards. Um, and just mm -hmm. to know that you're like making the world a little bit better, you know, by just sharing your voice and sharing your stories. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, George, Sarah, what do you feel are some ways that you, you know, feel the goodness from your channel? George? Yeah, uh, definitely. I, it feels like, you know, one thing's consistent is that we all started the channel, you know, thinking about helping people or just, you know, trying to help our past selves. And when you see that validated through personal messages or just comments, it really made you feel like you're doing something right. And to be honest, I think these comments or messages can be really surprising. I could think that the video is helping people in a certain way, but it actually expanded or you know went into a different direction. Um, I think, for example, I made a video about introversion with a product manager, and we just talk about if you are like that, is that, is that an innate blocker for you to be successful? And so we talked about it more, more from a personal and emotional aspect, not necessarily like tactical and people felt comforted. And I think that was just like absolutely beautiful. Um, and another thing I would add is that because my channel is Chinese, I haven't, I'm from Taiwan, haven't been home for like four years maybe. Mm. And so just connect with people back home and you know, they will tell me about home stuff. And that's also very uh, comforting for me. So that's kind of an added bonus. I didn't think 
it was gonna it was gonna happen oh no that is so beautiful it's like getting to be all over the universe at the same time with anyone who you connect with magic sarah what magic have you felt yeah i think i really agree with what everyone here has said um definitely for me the biggest benefit of having the channel is community which was also one thing that I really didn't necessarily expect going into the channel. Um, so I think, you know, receiving these messages where people are like, thank you so much, like you helped me land like this job offer or you helped me pass this interview. Like those are the most heartwarming messages that really make, as Han mentioned, all the technical difficulties worth it because the technical difficulties are real. Like sometimes mm -hmm. the camera you'll be talking for 20 minutes and you'll be like, oh my God, the camera died. So there's all these little moments like where you're troubleshooting that you don't realize you spend so much time troubleshooting. Um, and I would say that's the most frustrating part of YouTube is like all the technical difficulties. And these comments really make it worth it. Like for people, you know, take the time to send you an email, for example, or an Instagram message or comment on YouTube. Um, and I think one thing that has really come of that is me going into design coaching, where I spend time coaching people, um, whether it's whiteboarding or just generally having a career chat with them to talk about what their goals are. Um, it's the same sort of thing, but even building on that relationship where you really have a personal connection, then you're talking to each other for quite a while. And then at the end, they're so grateful and thankful. Um, and it feels like such a small thing, uh, but the impact is so huge. And so, yeah, it's, it's just really rewarding in that sense. Like it's almost selfish because you feel good that you've helped them as well, you know? Um, so I think those connections are just so great, especially with like, a, it's quite an international community. Like when I look at my analytics, the people following me are not necessarily from the US. There's people all over the world, like um, in India or in Europe or in Japan. Um, and I've moved around quite a bit. So um, I think Risa will know this term, but my mom calls me a hikoshi bimbo, which is like a person that's poor because they move around a lot. <laughs> so I'm like constantly living in different countries. Um, and I think, you know, being able to connect with people internationally on that level is also so nice during COVID when we're just kind of in, inside all the time. Yeah, it sounds like taking your home with you wherever you go, all of, all of you are, all of us are you know, this space on the World Wide Web, that's this magical dimension, but that's, but at the same time, hearing you, Sarah, um, it, it doesn't sound selfish because you're serving what you're getting. Like each of you are responding to your audience, those that are you're connecting with, which is inspiring you to take a different step. So that, that's really, oh, I have like the chills. Inspiring that it, the internet's a real place. Um, but I, I'd love to redirect for a second to why we're all here today, which is the World Information Architecture um, Day, you know, that avenue of communication. And what would you say, or how would you say that information architecture has played a role for you in the way you approach design or content creation in your channel? How would you say information architecture plays a role in your life? Yeah, I can maybe start. Um, yeah, thank you. I think like a lot of people, even when I started, when I think about IA, I would think it's, you know, wireframing level things, you know, like UI level things. Um, but over the years, what I really learned is that it actually is a great tool for you to work and collaborate with your partners from the get go. Um, so when we think about defining requirements before we start any sort of design explorations, it's actually good to st start with like um, thinking about information architecture because then it also helps you um, spread out your actions or information over all these different touch points. So it's not necessarily just, you know, sometimes it's easy to think that it's one screen, you're just managing that screen, um, but it's not necessarily the case. And when you think about, you know, a designer's uh, superpower uh, working at that uh, product defining phase, IA is a really great tool for you to communicate uh, what you can input. Uh, so I think that's something that I also learned. I wanted to, to add and share with everyone that we should definitely use this as a, a tool 
in the beginning uh, when we start working with our partners. Oh, I love that designer superpower. That is the coolest sentence. Um, how has information architecture impacted you, Han? Were you going to take that? Yeah, I was just actually going to add on. I think it makes it a very um, good starting ground um, to talk again to your cross-functional partners. I think a big part of what I do when I do kickoffs is laying out all the information and then getting really, really nitty gritty. I'm a stickler on taxonomy um, because there have been so many projects where we've literally, like, I we. I, we would, you know, be midway through the project and be using the same term to def like, but we're referring to completely different things. Um, and so I think for me, just laying all that out and now I like have a glossary. I'm like, okay, you're saying metric. What do you mean by metric? What are we measuring? And is that like a metric? You're talking about uh, efficiency. What is efficiency to you? And I guarantee you, if you ask three different people on a tech team, what one word means they all have their versions of it and so I like our AA in as a tool where you are able to um, consolidate everyone's answers and that you have like this very clear path forward and you're using the same language you're almost like like basically like evening it out um, and, and so I think using the same language especially because communication is such a core part of um, building uh, tech um, being able to do that from the outside is going to help your projects a hundred times over. Oh, that is key, key. And I'm seeing people in the comments loving that. that that's a right on. Um, Risa, Sarah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, so when I hear IA, information architecture, I think uh, a couple of years ago, I would have probably thought about like the bottom app navigation, right? So like Uber, Twitter, you have like, um, uh, timeline, profile, whatever. But now when I hear the word information architecture, I think of like organization and keeping yourself organized. So um, because I learned what IA was in a design perspective, now I feel like I'm more organized and this uh, the outcome is like having an organized Figma file uh, that is well the information architecture is super clear from a person who's looking at this design file for the first time. It's about um, keeping your Asana board, um, the task management tool organized so that people who's on a different pod team can like look at your board and see exactly, oh, what this team's priority is, the goal is. So uh, yeah, it, it's like, it's impacted my life so much and, especially joining Netflix, there's thousands and thousands of documents that has historical context, right? So as a new hire, the first thing that I did was, okay, I, I need to figure out all these thousands of documents and make it sense for myself. So the first thing I did was I centralized all the document to a deck that made sense to me. So it has a huge impact on what I, the actions I take um, in everyday basis, I think. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It sounds like it. That's a great way to take us through all the ways it can impact the life. Sarah, what are your thoughts on, on this? Yeah, I completely agree with uh, everything everyone said. I think, you know, being a designer has really changed who I am as a person and how I think and how I approach problems, like even in my personal life or how I approach YouTube, um, because you almost learn like a framework for how to think it is a framework for how to think and how to solve problems. And so this means that you know when you're thinking about information architecture, you might think, well, how do we get the user from start to finish in the most logical and easy way possible? Um, but I also think that's really about understanding the goals. So like really understanding who the user is, what they're trying to accomplish, like how this helps the business um, and how you can get them there. And I have a background in growth design originally. And so I really think like, okay, how can we make this like the most simple, the quickest, the least amount of steps to get them to their goal? Um, and how do we measure that? And you know, how do we measure it now and compare it to once we make these changes? And how do we make it incremental so we know exactly what the impact was of a change? Um, so yeah, th these are the kind of things that I think about. And also in general, I guess it's like with information architecture, you can make it really easy for yourself. And instead of guessing, just do tests on the user, like card sorting or something. Um, and yeah, really make sure that you are addressing exactly what the challenges are. Mm, yes, absolutely. 
Wow, that's so many great things to think about. Um, oh. <laughs> oh no, please go, go, go. No, I was gonna say I actually have a very. I just re I just remembered a really um, funny like I like in real life example of how information architecture um, yes. is kind of like permeated through. Um, my husband's family owns a, a grocery store. And so in, I was helping stacking shelves and the way they had stacked the shelves was the tea. So there was like a million teas cause it's a Persian store. Um, and so the way they did it was by type. Whereas I'm very used to by brand, right? So it's like, do you group all the same brands together or do you group all the same types together? So all the green teas go here, all the jasmine teas. And so we kind of went back and forth on it. Um, and so I thought that was really funny because I'm like, I know better. I'm a designer. I do this for a living. He's like, no, no, but like our, our, like for us, people go for the tea and they, they'll look for the tea. So it's like they want pomegranate tea. They'll go look for the tea. If they don't have the brand that they want, then they'll go for another brand. So for in that context, so it's oh, totally up to the user. Like Sarah mentioned, it's like in that context, the user wants the tea, the type of tea first, and it's not necessarily around brand loyalty. So that was Ooh, no that's a great insight it's like knowing your audience knowing who it is you're communicating to that's exciting yeah as a, I'm a people person also so getting to know like the people's why um and coming from it from that end that's so fascinating and neat um let's see I know we're going to start getting to some uh, questions from our chat but I had one other little question out after getting to know you all and um, things like that, which this is so fun. Who are some people that are either books, people, resources, media, channels of yourself that have inspired you along your journey as UX communicators, creators, things like that, if you have one or any? This might um, even just- Yeah, I watched, oh, sorry. No, is go someone's ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> So the future. Christo uh, is definitely, you know, some, I think almost like any designer I talk to like knows him to a certain degree because his channel is really big now. Um, and I know that I looked at them a lot because I wanted to do a product design version of that or like a certain type of kind of um, parallels there. So I look at that a lot. And I think, you know, he, he shared his experiences of starting without being able to connect with the camera, feeling comfortable with it too. And that's something that I struggled with when I started. Um, so I think like, if, even if you are just thinking about starting a channel, whether it's design or not, you know, looking at someone growing and see that journey is possible, uh, is already very uh, validating. So mm. that's the person I looked at before. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm sitting here feeling like, what's my channel going to be in 10 minutes? Because you all have been inspiring me like crazy. I'm not kidding. I'm writing all these little notes of like, that's a good nugget. That's so cool. Anyone else like a book, maybe a movie? I don't know. I'm getting a little wild up in here, but I'm just curious what gets you, your juices flowing. Oh, Risa, go ahead. And then uh, on. Okay, so... There's a couple, but one, first one uh, is y Yuki Yamashita. I think he's a VP of product at Figma, but I think uh, for me personally, he was super inspiring because he has a Japanese name, right? And for the longest time, I've been applying for American company back in Japan, like six years straight. I, I think I applied more than hundred companies at this point, but it just, I, because I didn't see um, Japanese role model outside of Japan, I felt like it was almost impossible to, to become a global designer at that point. But then I saw his name and his talks about how he approaches product and design and how he grew Figma and Uber and all these fabulous products. And he was definitely some, somebody who really encouraged me to get myself out there in front of the camera so that you know folks in Japan has some reference to make. Um, yeah, and then there's one more. Lovers Magazine is a great source. It's you, you can Google it and it'll pop up. Um, they feature a lot of designers across the world and they share their stories. So it's super inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so check it out. Lovers Magazine. Oh, that's so cool. 
anything else, Han, were you going to share? Oh yeah. I was just going to say, I'm like a YouTube junkie too. And so I watch <laughs> so many people across so many different um, genres. Um, but I think uh, in terms of like just tech, um, Sarah and I are part of a design creators sort of like little group um, and we're all in design as well. And so I, I think everyone in there inspires me because everyone's just sharing their things. And a lot of times, um, you know, our topics will overlap, but the way that we present the content is so different and so unique. And so I really like that where now um, as YouTube is having more design creators on there, there's going to be so many different voices. And like um, Risa mentioned, representation is so important, right? To be able to see someone like you or like someone that has gone through your struggles um, kind of get to where they are now is like really, really empowering. Um, but I love like Miyuko's channel. Um, Chloe, Colors of Chloe, I believe her name is. She's a product is a product manager over at Discord. Um, I like the future too. Um, Matthew and Cena, I think he just he kind of left the future is doing his own thing, but like the Casey Neistat. So it's just, you know, even though um they are creatives, um, I still glean a lot of um, inspiration from what they do just because of how in love they are with their craft and like mm -hmm. how they push to be better and better and I'm like yeah like I, I see myself in that even though you know they're in, in a totally different industry mm, yes oh that's so cool I'm like trying to jot things down I'm glad this is being recorded and we're going to talk about where you can find this um and then just a little bit um but Sarah did you have anything you'd like to add this is such a tough question because I feel like I'm constantly consuming things. Like in the morning, I wake up and listen to a podcast. Um, I know this is maybe less common, but I am a huge reader. So I read like constantly, like, yeah, a lot of books. Um, and when I do coaching calls, I'm constantly recommending books to people. And I know that sometimes people don't like to read. So then I'm like, okay, watch the author's talk or like watch the TED talk or something, you know, because some people yes. just don't want to read or I'm like, read an audio, listen to an audio book. Um, I think, you know, one person that definitely um, kind of sparked the idea in me to start a YouTube channel is Hello, I'm Alexa. And that's also a creator that's in the group with Han and I. Um, yeah, thinking off the top of my head, I think Femke has a great YouTube channel for product designers specifically. Um, Charlie more for like brand design, uh, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I have a hard time coming up with names, but there's just so, so many. Oh, you all shared so many. And now us being able to use this panel as a resource. And I know when I start one, you will all be listed. And I'm not just saying that. This has been the coolest flow of information from all over the world where everyone is hearing each of you. I feel like we all got to know all of you so much better. And Marina, I see you have joined us. Yes, I popped up randomly. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you're going to bring us some of the questions that are chat, which is, I love this chat, man. It's like we need yeah. more emojis in there. It's, it's dedication. So yeah, we have so many questions yeah, in the Q&A, which hear is some really of great. Them. Um, so, uh, one that I think, uh, is super relevant. Um, so what video topics bring the most new viewers to your channel? Uh, what UX topics attract, uh, non UX people to your channel? Hmm. Okay. I have an idea. <laughs> um, I'm just going to throw it out there. Yes. Uh, so I think on my channel, like. I try not to look at analytics much actually, cause I feel that's not why I'm creating. Um, but one thing I did notice is that the salary video I did blew up and got thousands of views. Uh, so I think, you know, there is a desire to, for people to talk about salary um, and for people to just understand like, what is, what is my earning potential in my city and whatnot. And that's so difficult because it's so personal to where everyone's located and their experience and everything but these videos are really popular. Um, and I noticed that with other creators channels as well, that there's a lot of activity on salary videos. Um, so I, I really love that transparency because I think it's so important, you know, that we're all kind of aligned on like, you know, what the possibilities are. Um, I think, sorry, can you repeat your second question? I had an idea for that. <clears throat> uh, yes. Uh, what topics attract non-UX people to your channel? 
Oh yeah. Okay. So for this one, what I was going to say is I did a video on um, why designers should know product requirements document. And from that, I had a lot of people more like product managers or operations people maybe watching. And um, one guy even sent me like a really nice long email about how much it helped him. Uh, and that was really early on when I started my channel. So that, you know, was really nice and really encouraged me to continue. Does anyone else want to take a stab at that question? Yeah, um, I think uh, Sarah hit the nail. It's like anything to do, I'm going to like a peek behind the screen. So like day in the life videos are like massive. So if anybody wants to start a channel and you are uh, a designer, whatever you're doing, people love a day in the life. People love to see like, ooh, you know, like, what do you do? Um, uh, I think salary is also a big one. Um, and uh, what else? Um, I think how to get into UX was a big one for me. And then like portfolio tips, because I think portfolio, whiteboarding, interviewing, those are like really, really hot topics that even like, even myself, when I was in the interviewing process, I was re reviewing a bunch of things, even though I've done this a few times, um, it's just so good to have refreshers. Um, and so those topics are always like really hot topics, really hot for searches as well. Um, and then the one video that I didn't realize would get the, um, reaction and just discussion was one that I'd filmed um, at the height of the Black Lives Matters movement, um, outlining my own experience with um, latent racism and growing up in an at-risk neighborhood and witnessing racism like and it was very blatant and no one cared um and so just kind of talking about that um and i think it resonated with a lot of people so i i think those videos are things that sometimes maybe if i had second like second guessed it i wouldn't have posted it because again it is controversial but the fact that i did post it it resonated a lot with um people and people said wow like you explain it in a different way that i never realized and so I think it's important, A, to talk about design and sharing all those experiences, but also all the adjacent topics that you've experienced in your life. Amazing. Um, okay, so we, I'm going to do one more YouTube related question. Um, so uh, what are your thoughts on the increased shift to shorts from the 10 minute plus videos? How does that influence your content? Oh, we've tried shorts actually. Um, you know, I think we were really like traffic driven when we started shorts. Like, uh, to be completely frank, I don't think we were like, oh my God, short is the best format for the type of content we're creating. It was mostly for exposure or just, you know, increasing that traffic sake. Um, I think we, we weren't able to actually do it consistently because, you know, including myself and other creators on the channel, everyone felt like they couldn't really express anything quality. Um, so it just didn't feel like us, so we stopped doing. Uh, so we didn't have that consistency yet to tell if it's actually a very good tool to increase traffic. Um, so, you know, the goal that we set in the beginning, we didn't really carry it through. But I think like what we also learned is that we just have to be authentic, uh, really just look at what is important to us. Um, and in terms of like increasing traffic, maybe we'll find other ways to do so, but not necessarily compromising our authenticity. Um, who knows? Like, I think maybe in the future, we'll find ways, find content that's good for this uh, format. But right now we got a lot to say and the shorts are not for us at the moment. Okay. Um, so here's kind of a, uh, thought provoking one. Um, <clears throat> so on the topic of designers bridging gaps in organizations through communication, do the panelists have any practical experience or wisdom communicating that value to the broader organization? Um, put another way, designers are doing the work that needs done, but others may not recognize is it as the designer's domain. Um, so how would you, do you have any wisdom communicating uh, to the broader organization, um, you know, how to communicate? Okay, if I've understood the question correctly, 
I think that it's really about bringing people into your process, like from the beginning all the way to the end and making sure that you're advocating for the design work that's being done, but also really trying to understand what other people are doing. Like, you know, you're working so closely with a product manager or the engineering lead or engineers that I, I like... You know, I don't want to use this word because I feel like it's so overused, but alignment is so important for everyone to just really be on the same page. Like Han mentioned taxonomy, things like that are so important to make sure that everyone is like actually understanding what you're talking about in the same way. Um, and so I think, yeah, it's really, you know, for example, if you start research, you might not think to bring engineers into the research process, but actually they get really excited about it and it helps them understand what you're trying to accomplish for later on down the line. Um, so yeah, little things like that. Yeah, I love yeah. that, Sarah. And I would just add also, um, I don't know if uh, everyone watched a uh, Netflix show like Inventing Anna, or like if you've read the story about Elizabeth Holmes, one consistent story or narrative is that they found sponsors, <clears throat> right? They found people that are powerful and then other powerful people just kind of got into a trap believing that that first person definitely had good reasons to trust you and so I, I know it's a little tricky but i think you know when it comes to reality you might also want to make sure that the alignment that you get from are from the people that can actually be sponsors and are influential in your in your environment yeah and i'm super passionate about this topic um like i mentioned before i think powerful designers not only design products, but design partnerships, right? So um, there's a couple of ways to do it. One way is, is to really clarify what our roles are and how it intersects with other roles. Uh, one interesting framework that I've stumbled up upon was the triad magic. So it means um, it, it visualizes the relationship between design, business, and engineering partnership. So that was one thing I've done at my previous company where, where I felt like there was a misalignment in what they expect a designer to do. The first thing I did was I, I did a lightning talk about how, how um, the triad magic works and how that we could leverage that framework into our organization. So uh, it's kind of like take, um, taking the team to a ride and understanding each other through workshops, lightning talks, and sharing each other's strengths and weaknesses. Uh, we did a couple of uh, workshops. And also one thing is to set up a one-on-one -on -one with the folks that you feel like there's a misalignment that really builds trust within each other. And it goes a long, long way. So when I joined Netflix, I think the first month, I just really hyper-focused on building trust. I didn't touch Figma at all. And so trust and relationship building is so important for the product and your success. Great. Okay, we have time for one more quick question before we get into promoting your channels. So everyone can take note of your social and everything. Um, all right, so uh, what do you find best helps when trying to find inspiration for a design or project? I literally go to the most powerful search engine, Google. I just Google the crap out of things that I'm looking at. Like even for, I was redoing my office um, in anticipation of starting this new role. Um, and I, I was on Pinterest. I, I essentially like just immerse myself in the world of whatever that I need to design. Um, if that is a uh, purchase flow, I'll go look at every single purchase flow. I'll download a bunch of apps and see what their purchase flows are what I like about it, what's relevant to ours, what I don't like, um, and really just, again, immerse myself in that world to see, okay, these are the things I like, and then, you know, dive into a bit more and kind of start that. Um, but sometimes inspiration is just really like, for me, talking to people and bouncing ideas off of each other. I think that's something I missed a lot from, um, you know, moving to remote. You don't have uh, the ability to sit next to your friends in the kitchen anymore and like design next to each other, which is one of my favorite things. Um, but we started doing design jams. So it's literally just hopping onto a Google Meet and like designing and being like, hey, what do you think of this screen that I just designed? Um, so I think that for me is just like, yeah, go like Googling the crap out of it uh, and then just designing along with us, other designers. 
Yeah, plus one to everything and uh, adding a community into that too. Um, so when I uh, when uh, working at some of the project at my company, when, when I have second guesses of which direction to go, I would uh, post it in a group Slack channel, right? Usually back in the day, I, I used to be super introvert. So I would just send it to through a DM to the most close designer. But now I try to force myself to do it in a bigger group. And then you'll I'll, I'll get surprised of all the responses I get. And same for not just within the company, but I belong to this community called On Deck Designers. And I do the same thing there. Uh, one of the recent prompt that I posted was about like, how do you keep single source of truth in Figma? And then designers from Asana, like, I don't know, all these incredible designers helped me get to the solution. So community um, have been helpful for me. Great, Any, anyone else? All right. Um, I think that now is the time to bring up some uh, um, of the slides that we have prepared for that show off your channels. Uh, Celine, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, this is the part I've been waiting for, for all of you to get to subscribing. Um, and why don't we talk about or have as your slide is up, if you could just share what are some of the campaigns or exciting things you're going to be releasing on your YouTube channels while people write these down and subscribe, George. Okay, I didn't know that I was going to be the first, but thanks. Um, <laughs> yes, so as you can tell, the channel is called Unblock. Uh, it's not the easiest for SEO, so if you're if you speak Chinese, put Unblock, Xue Yuan or Unblock. Xiao Zhi Xian is my Chinese name. Um, you can find it pretty easily, or you just put Unblock UX UI. Just put a lot of additional terms. You probably will find it. Um, we have on the banner, you can tell uh, on top of myself, there's uh, Xingyu, Lily, Blair, and Alexis. They are in charge of like um, different domains for the channel. Um, the I think the exciting thing that's pretty recent is that we have a um, six month exclusive partnership with ATP List where each month we have a sesh group session. Um, and the topic for that series is design influence. Um, so I bring a person um, every session to talk about influence in a specific area. So it could be uh, influencing your immediate design team. So your design peers, how do you influence them? How do you manage up influence design leaders, influence product team, influence marketing team, um, et cetera. And starting from this month uh, that I'm actually gonna kick off with my, my twin brother who is um, uh, design director at uh, OkCupid. So. <laughs> Feel free to go to ADP List website and you should be able to find it. And you have a twin. There's two Georges <laughs> in the world. What? There's what? two of me. Oh, yeah. amazing. Thank you. Yes, snaps. I love to snap with my teams as a form of applause. So thank you. Subscribe thank you. to George. All right, where's our next juicy slide? It's Han. Han, share with us what you got cooking. Um, well, um, I actually am starting a new role on Monday. So all of you have gotten a preview or I guess I haven't really made it be a huge announcement, but I am moving on from Wattpad um, and joining uh, Scotia Digital as a design manager. So I'm going to be documenting a lot of like the day ones, the day, like the week one stuff um, as well, like an office tour and just like, you know, less designy stuff and more of like the lifestyle stuff um, as well as I'm thinking of like mom slash designer so like the mom work balance I think that's something that is I don't know if it's interesting but that's something I'm going through and so I'm um, always looking for tips tricks on time management because that is like a whole new field that I uh, need to get used to oh my gosh you're totally gonna start a mom club with <laughs> UI UX Risa pizza Share one minute us. left just a reminder yep, we're wrapping it up <laughs> cool yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, I think compared to other folks in the panel, I, I have a small subscriber and I only have six videos up, but um, I will try to keep going. And um, a couple of things that's on top of mind, uh, videos that I'm planning to work on is how to be successful in behavioral interviews or joining a new company. 
And I also want to try posting some Jap uh, j contents for Japanese folks too. So. Oh, that's so awesome. Risa Pizza, love it. And Sarah, last hey. but certainly not least, what do you have coming up? Um, oh, so much. I have a backlog of videos. As I continue to get ideas, I write it down and I also ask my audience regularly. So um, maybe the best thing is if you follow me on Instagram, that's usually where I do polling and like announce the type of videos I'll make. Um, and yeah, I have a really exciting partnership coming up with a very large company. Um, and I'll, I'll post about that. So I can't give yes. too many details now, but yeah. Oh, I love a cliffhanger at Sarah Tajima. <laughs> Thank you to every panelist here. Thank you all of you attendees. This will be uploaded um, on the World IA Day YouTube channel. So I've been Missy Marino, your host, and I'm so happy I got to moderate this. Thank you, everybody. Find me on the internet and let's all be friends. Yay, World IA Day. <laughs>